Whether you're a chess beginner or intermediate, size may not matter, but your opening truly does. The point is that we can split opening between two main categories, traditional openings, you know, stuff like Rui Lopez and pretty much what your grandfather used to play in his childhood. But then the nice part is that you also have system openings. Now, the spiel with system openings is that you can pretty much follow only one very simple idea in order to develop your pieces and get a pretty interesting position to play. I know what you may be thinking. Oh shit, this guy is gonna show me another weird ass London system video. I'm kind of like tired of this. I'm like actually even trying to hide because the internet is simply bombarded by these kind of content. I understand that. I kind of know where this is coming from. However, I got some good news. In this video, I'm not mainly referring to the London system, but his evil brother, the Jobava London. Now, the biggest counter for the Jobava London can be the King's Indian kind of opening. All right, so after you play something like D4, uh, let's just assume Black plays the move D6. All right, and we're sticking with our setup. And then you're gonna notice that when the bishop develops to f4, you will no longer be getting the same kind of knight b5 variations because the pawn on d6 is just restricting the bishop. So now they're gonna fianchero and the game has to take a slightly different path. Okay, listen carefully because to my surprise, there's actually one variation that you can play which is genuinely gonna give you a Checkmate in no more than 10 moves in the majority of your games if you're using the approach that I suggest. And I'm not even exaggerating. In the first part of the video, we're going to be dealing with the fianchettos, and then we're going to be addressing the more common D5 lines. Disclaimer, before we start, I want you to be very well aware of the fact that if you're watching this full video, not only that you may add a few extra inches to your penis, but you may also find a girlfriend in the process. Enjoy. All right, everybody getting another game with the white pieces. And open up with d4 and uh, okay. This is already becoming very interesting because opponent plays d6. What's the point with d6? How does this change the situation anyway? Well, the point is it's pretty much one of the biggest counters to the Jubava London because Technically, if you still develop your bishop to f4, it is not going to be the happiest bishop of all time. Why? Well, because it's simply kind of, you know, staring into this pawn. It's just like staring into an empty wall. However, let me tell you something. Bishops can sometimes break walls. Okay, let's see what opponent is going to play. Hoping we see a move like g6. Because when they play g6, okay, this is pretty much just getting the game back into the King's Indian territory. Right now, I want you to like really understand the fact that when he plays d6 on move one, you should pretty much uh, already somewhat expect the King's Indian. Because the pawn is literally restricting the bishop. This brings the question, okay. If the bishop is restricted, how on earth is black planning to develop that piece? Well, you can pretty much just think of it by elimination. Since this diagonal is not very interesting anymore, he's very likely to do the fianchero. Therefore, voila, you already know what your opponent is up to. Okay, now he plays g6 because we're playing the Jabavalon and facing the King's Indian. I'm going to be showing you a way to play against this that potentially is genuinely going to give us a win in six moves. E4. And this is very important because from my experience, people that pick up the Jabava have, you know, the hardest time dealing with a King's Indian and Fianchieros in general. So Bishop to G7, all right. Now here you pretty much have two choices. Two choices. You can go for like the old school way, which is perfectly fine. Like old school way would be queen d2, castles, and then you have a simple plan. You want to start bishop h6, long castle, f3, just in case, and then you do h4, h5, open up the file, trade bishops, 
going to take back. You check with the queen. His king goes back. And then because you want to mate on h7, you need to get rid of this knight. Therefore, you do play e5. He moves the knight. You take on h7, mate. You win the game. That works. However, um, if you want to go for like the simplified approach, you play e5. That has very big odds of giving you a quick checkmate. He's playing the e5, which is the main move, all right? Like, uh, I expect you to face this around, like, 8 out of 10 games, according to the statistics, because Black knows when they are playing the King's Indian, which is actually, in this case, a pure defense, since uh, I have knight on c3 and I didn't play c4. Don't worry about it. It's not a very important detail uh, about the knight. Well, they know... The problem with the opening is that black is getting mated. Therefore, they're going to be more than happy to exchange queens. Since, you know, no queens means no checkmate. At least they think. And end games are relatively safe for black. They even think, oh, maybe this pawn on e5 is weak. Maybe I can win it. So you want to take with a rook. Pretty simple. Just bring another piece into the attack. And now they need to move the knight. Okay, he attacks bishop. And here, most of the people would be doing something like, okay, bishop is under attack. I gotta move. Don't. Okay? Just don't. You gotta look for a counterattack instead. I'm gonna give you a hint. You can try to pause the video and come up uh, with a move on your own. Point is, c7 is the weakest spot in black's camp. It's pretty much a healer's heal at this point. So we're going to target that with knight d5. Question for you though. Why not knight b5? We're going to do this. And from my experience, they generally just take the bishop. Thinking that, oh, he's going to take on c7. He's going to take my rook. But maybe then the knight gets trapped. He either goes knight f4 or knight a6. From my experience. Okay, we're going to be taking on c7. Yeah, getting a nice little four going. And, okay, you may be tempted to think, what is this guy even waiting for? Why is he not uh, capturing the rook? I don't get it. It's like, this is the thing when you come to this YouTube channel, okay, if it's your first time here. Like, you feel like, okay, maybe I can uh, learn a thing or two. can be somewhat helpful. I'm not going to subscribe yet, because I don't know, this guy still looks weird. But no, dude, this looks nice, but I'm telling you, we're here for the good stuff. So the good stuff is... Open up your eyes as you play. Pretty pro tip. You get a made in one. Made in ten moves, literally. And this is like not even, you know, something that, uh, you know, sometimes happen. No, it actually happens all the time. And the main reason why this is actually so stunning is that the hardest counter for players that pick up the Jabava London is the king's indian because you no longer get any fun with you know like you, you don't get knight b5 knight c7 kind of work none of that then how do you win i mean i just showed you but still you get the point you face the king's indian move like g6 for those of you that are like somewhat confused by the move order generally okay don't worry if they start with d6 that's like one thing we just got a transposition Normally, you're going to be getting this after like knight f6, you play knight c3, they do g6. You can start either with a bishop or with a pawn. And then you play e4. They do d6. And this is the traditional way of reaching this position. Okay, you play e5. Now, I know some people may be wondering, okay, but, uh, you know, I, I listened. I tried. Um, my opponent did not take. He played knight d7 and uh, I got uh, completely brutalized. Well, don't worry, because we're also going to be having uh, a game with that during this video. So, okay, th that is pretty much, uh, you know, very little and cheesy idea that you can use. And, okay, you may be wondering, well, if this is so effective, why are not more people playing like this? Well, I'm going to give you the theoretical state of the variation. So, you play e5. Now, the best move for black is something that pretty much nobody does. Not even like some grandmasters, because I've played this line a bunch onto my main account, around like 2700 uh, Blitz. 
I even had one game against the Grandmaster where he literally went for the same very variation. And my game against the Grandmaster actually went uh, d5. He entered the endgame and played knight fd7 instead. So I played knight e5. He tried uh, king to d8. And then I played the move e6. Just winning. Okay, completely winning. If pawn takes, you have knight c7. And the key idea is that on e5, you don't go greedy. But you turn. This is what I played. I had this position in my game. Bishop c4 coming. White is completely winning. I kind of messed it up a little, but ended up converting. It was a blitz game. So, uh, okay, e5. Now, the best variation that black can play is knight e5. And here the point is to go bishop to d2, which is a very odd move, and it just feels like the strangest thing of all time. But I promise it makes a whole lot of sense, because... Well, if you were to go on to e3, black has the e5, and then you pretty much have nothing better than either taking or knight f3. Anyways, in a lot of these positions, you are allowing a queen trade in a worse version. So when they play knight h5, the idea is to play bishop d2. We're pretty much gambiting the pawn, but we want to keep queens on the board. So that you can play queen e2. Bishop will move back, and then you have castle. So then, okay, you just go g4, h4. You're down a pawn. But according to the computer, the position is equal. And from my experience, I really find it easier for white to play. So I just think it's a great surprise weapon that you can use. Okay. That's pretty much all the details, and it is important that after knight h5, you go knight d5, giving yourself the opportunity of mating knight a6 with bishop takes on a6. Okay, very important. Why is this so clever? Because if you were to play knight to b5, but you know, in a nutshell, if he just takes on f4, you go knight c7, you checkmate, you just transpose. You think you just played a great game? No, in fact, he didn't. Knight b5. Completely nonsense move because he has knight a6 and bishop cannot jump over the knight. Notice, you try bishop takes on a6. Oh, that's not going to work. That is very important why you want to play knight b5 instead. I mean, knight e5, you get it. <laughs> you want to give yourself the opportunity of eliminating this knight so black simply has no way to defend against this. So... With that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another white game. I'm going to be sticking with uh, d4. And the opponent just plays d6, all right? So he's not playing the normal, let's say, kind of black rebel while like striking in the center, but he's in fact a rebel. Okay, he's probably very likely to play the king's Indian type of setup. So we're going to start with e4 or bishop to f4. You can actually do both. Alright, I'm just gonna do bishop f4 because I know you guys are like more likely to just pre move these moves. And on to g6, it is very important that you kind of realize that, okay, we are facing the king's Indian, but you already need to have this kind of, uh, you know, fire in your brain that played king's Indian, we're gonna mate him in 10 moves. Chick mate him in 10 moves, are you nuts? Just watch out. We're gonna play the move e4. And the bishop g7 just hit their knight. They're gonna take. Because this is how players within this rating range play. They're gonna be taking like uh, 8 games out of 10. And we're gonna be taking back with a pawn. Very simple stuff, okay? Then they're gonna be happily entering the end game. Okay, never mind. This guy just plays knight to d7, okay? Knight to d7. Is that even a move? Okay, some people get that. Alright. Okay, not a biggie. They will have the knight. Why? This is a threat. They want to take and win a pawn. We cannot give them uh, three pawns. It's not Black Friday for pawns. Not today. And the key move is queen e2. Because in a lot of positions, black is ready to go knight e6 and put even more pressure on e5. So queen e2, it does appear to be blocking the bishop on f1, but it's uh, giving us the really important uh, layer of protection that we need. Or the e5 square and a long castle and 
You don't need to be worried about the fact that, okay, the queen is going to be misplacing the bishop on uh, f1 for like the rest of your life, basically. No, the queen is still a free piece. Queen is going to go to e3. Supporting bishop h6, we do that. Okay, just watch out. And all this time, the pawn is really nicely defended. I want you to pay attention how nicely the pawn on e5 is covered. He does his nonsense, we do our nonsense. Let's see what nonsense is going to be stronger. I genuinely have a simple plan. h5 take, trade bishops, bring queen. b4, okay, let's not lose knight. How about that? That would be a pretty good idea, I feel like. If I go knight e4, he has de, de, and then... Yeah, he genuinely has no way to win the pawn. So as long as you calculate that, you can play aggressive. If you were to play passive, like knight b1, reasonable as well. Now, I want to do h5, but because of his last move, this may be an indicator that uh, he either wants to take on e5 or he wants to play something like bishop h8. So now we're going to take. No need to give him bishop back, and then we push h5. Very important, because if you don't push it, then he may do h5 himself. You have no... Uh, you're no longer going to get that much speed for the attack. You're going to slow down a little. So threat is to take and play queen h6. He plays d5. What do you think? We're going to be like, Oh, uh, he's attacking my knight. I need to somehow move the knight and then maybe focus on the attack. I think I'm going to be good anyways. No, dude. You're about to genuinely checkmate. There's no time for like caring about knights. Like, are you even kidding me, bro? I mean, you've been watching the channel already for quite a bit of time. You know this much about this variation, okay? Bring the queen. Simple stuff. No need to worry about irrelevant pieces when we can just end the game. I mean, that is pretty simple stuff. And remember this, play your Bava London. Yusuf Yankero with d6, that is the King's Indian. Yusuf Yankero with pawn on d5, that is a bit different. It's Grunfeld. You can still try out something similar, however. Like, just imagine, uh, you know, black plays something like this and then goes g6. All right, you can still try queen e2, bishop g7, and then uh, let's say like bishop h6 stuff. Take castle short, you go long castle, and then you play h4, h5. The main idea being, uh, okay, like f3 here, and let's say your opponent just randomly starts pushing. If they take, why well, just has easy game to end it on the spot, rook h5. If bishop takes, you take with a rook, extra piece. If pawn takes, uh, simple move, queen g5. Unstoppable checkmate, just an easy way to deal with this kind of fianqueros in general. It's a job of the player. Especially if, you know, you're playing this game below like uh, 1800, so. With that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody getting another white game. Gonna open up with uh, d4. And when I'm playing d5, so we're facing somebody that's rated almost 800. We're gonna be sticking with uh, our beloved aggressive Jibaba London. And uh, let's see what kind of setup he's gonna be playing. Typically, I am expecting a move like knight f6, but also I wouldn't be shocked if they develop the other knight, uh, which is, uh, yeah, already telling something pretty important about the position. And this is very common for low-rated players because they play the so-called uh, Chigorin variation. And okay, we're going to be playing, uh, you know, our usual thing, just getting the bishop uh, out. You already know. Introducing ideas of knight b5. So currently, knight b5 is a huge threat. But luckily, okay, I'm saying this luckily because it gets to be a longer and therefore more instructive game. He plays a6, which is basically just saying, I know what you are trying to do. Not going to allow any of that. All right. What are we going to do if they stop knight b5? It is not like you play the job of and you expect uh, them to blunder, else you just lose. No, that's not how it works. We have a backup plan in case of whatever they do. All right, so first thing that you really want to pay attention as you play this opening, you generally want to play e3 before knight f3. All right, why? It is just a bit more flexible. So we're going to start with e3. And generally, I'm expecting either knight f6, either a bishop out. <clears throat> but we get to face uh, a fianchetto. All right, now, this is getting definitely in a little bit of a more uh, sort of Offbeat scenario, like I don't really expect you to face this uh, every single one of your games. But it can definitely be something that I've noticed a lot of players really struggle to deal with. So, 
there it goes. Whenever you see a move like G6, all right, you want to put your uh, aggressive pants on. What do I mean by that? Don't just play, okay. Knight F3, Bishop D3, castles. This is pretty much how uh, normal people would play this. Instead, we got to use the H pawn, all right? You got to target on G6. It's pretty much like begging for us to come in, you know? It's like saying, G6, oh, come here, attack me. You know, it may sound like a trap <laughs> on the right tone, but this is definitely advisable. And at this point, black has a choice, okay? Like, if you get in h5, that is great. You know, we're going to play it here. But what if he was uh, just blocking? Well, whenever they play a move like h5, that is creating a long-term weakness in the position, okay? The g5 square is going to be vulnerable. So therefore, you can use a move like knight f3, and then the knight is going to be having a very cozy spot on g5. Then you can follow it up with maybe like bishop d3, uh, f3, g4 type of ideas. You can long castle, and white is doing well. Bishop to f5, okay, what is that? We don't care. We continue with our plan, all right? We're just going to be doing a little bit of caveman uh, chess at this point. And all right, he plays knight to b4. Whenever he does something like this, you should be asking yourself, all right, what is my opponent really trying to do? What's the point behind his last move? Because you may be very tempted to go for a move like, okay, let's stay, let's open up Rook and enjoy life. No, are you even paying attention to the position? This is very important, right? So specifically, he made this two moves so that he wants a fork. He's pretty much, uh, at this point, is just, he, he has only one trick, okay? You defend against the fork, you already won the game. How do we defend? Well, we have either bishop d3 to block or rook to c1 in this position. Uh, both of these are fine. I'm just going to play rook c1 because I feel like uh, in the scenario where he takes, it's going to become uh, very instructive. Because it is very common for this rating range that uh, you get this sort of peace imbalance of uh, having, uh, let's say, uh, two minor pieces or rook and pawn. Because they try this shit all the time and then they just take. So just to kind of provoke it, I'm going to do g4, sort of trapping the bishop, but pretty much just incentivizing him to take. All right. I mean, in case he does not, we're going to win a piece. On bishop to e4, however. I don't recommend you take, I just recommend you play the simple move that a lot of people tend to overlook. They think, oh, just has a good bishop move on e4. Oh, no, th that, that's just irrelevant. You just have f3. This is usually the key move that a lot of people tend to underestimate because they think, oh, you're never supposed to play f3 and then it kind of looks weakening. I don't know. Dude, are you crazy? This just wins. <laughs> okay, it is very specific for the Jabal London though. And we get the scenario that uh, I've mentioned uh, a few moves ago. We got the two minor pieces and he has the rook. Who's better and why? How should we evaluate these type of positions, okay? Now, the nice thing about this is that uh, because it is such a common scenario, no matter what opening you play, okay, whether you play the Jabava, whether you do e4, e5 standard games, uh, you're going to be getting this a lot at the beginning. Well, the trick is, all right, you have to understand when do pieces are at their peak. All right. So, for example, a rook would be really uh, doing uh, nice work when the rook has open files. Okay, the rook really needs open files. It's like, you know, a swimmer that's, uh, you know, trying to jump into the pool, but there is no water. This is exactly how the rooks are failing right now. He's got two rooks, no open files. So, just going to do bishop e5, now kind of exploiting the fact that he does not have a good reply against it. Um, I'm going to proceed and perhaps open up my file. You know what? I'm just going to be utterly annoying, saying, all right, because rook want open files, I'm not going to open any files. All right, I'm just going to try to sort of keep the position locked while creating little threats, <laughs> but also improving my pieces, okay? Important, do not play hope chess, okay? This is not a hope chess move if it looks like that in the first place. Sure, we can get the fork, that's amazing, but the main idea is, okay, the knight is just heading towards c5 in case he defends against that. So he defends, knight goes to c5 as promised. 
And I know I've got these pieces undeveloped. I'm going to develop them uh, next. I'm just trying to sort of uh, pinch into his possession and uh, maybe create some weaknesses. What is the problem with b6? Because b6 is actually losing. And you see that it was such a natural move that my opponent instantly played it. Okay. Now, a lot of people may be like, fine. It is what it is. The knight has to go home. But now the knight can go aggressive. Why? Well, you just get to see the power of the minor pieces. Look, the knight is literally just grabbing a coffee in his backyard. The knight is just chilling. Defended by the bishop. This knight is like really misplaced. Okay, blocking bishop's path. So for this reason, we're pretty much chilling. Okay, just going to take free pawn. And then I'm just going to finish development of uh, with the rest of my pieces. You know, just keeping it very simple. King eight, I'm just going to yeah, win a tempo and then develop. The knight looks kind of... Uh, you know, a little bit potentially vulnerable. But his position is really passive, so he has no way to get to my knight. And uh, I'm just going to finish development. Maybe like a move such as king f2, g5 potentially. Just completely sort of uh, blockading the situation there. So that his pieces never really see the uh, light of the day. Um, it's, you know, pretty much um, opponent uh, <laughs> went home uh, during the night and expected to... Yeah, wake up the next day. Unfortunately, this thing will never happen. Unless I get flagged, of course. <laughs> so, uh, all right. King f2. I pretty much want to do king f2 g5 so that my pawn is defended. I want to bring the rook. And then I want to open up this path, okay? I feel like this is the weak spot. Why is c6 the main weakness to focus on in the position? Well, it is a pawn that cannot be protected by other pawns, plus it's uh, placed on the open file. So the C file is really where the action is happening, because it's the only open file that we have access to. And when I to see it, we're happy to trade, because we don't really have a choice. And uh, I'm just going to be playing a move like G5. And I want you to like really notice this whole time how tragic the situation for the rooks is that rooks simply do not have open files. So, okay, just going to defend this pawn because he attacked it with his last move. And I could even make a move like short castle, king f2, however. Pretty typical move for the Jobava in general. Definitely all good with that. And uh, I'm going to be utilizing a pretty uh, sneaky maneuver. All right, I'm going to do knight g1, knight f3. Here is just, uh, you know, a matter of time to improve position of your pieces however i have a feeling that we may not get to show this on the board since my opponent is about to flag but yeah needless to say the position is completely dominating obviously white is winning uh, as you can see it by the eval bar completely up onto the white side yeah engine wise i guess around like a plus three simple moves uh in this position I think would have been something like maneuvering the knight. So probably getting the knight all the way to b3 so it can access the c5 square, okay? It is very important that uh, in such situations you get into the habit of, all right, I got to like spot the main weakness. What is a weakness? Okay. Well, c6 is a target, but he can sort of defend it enough times. Then, okay, how do we improve our position? Well, bishops are kind of well placed. It's not much you can do about the bishops. And you figure out, okay, the knight can be improved. What would be a great square for the knight? Well, potentially e5 could be good, but the bishop is there. So then the other squares can be a5 or c5. So then you come up to the conclusion, all right, let's just uh, pretty much get his luggage ready because this uh, bad boy is going to be onto a pretty long journey. So then we just come with a route such as, let's say, how do I get a knight to b3? That's one way. Another way could be like a c3, b1, d2. It takes a little bit of moves, okay? But that's not really the problem. The main idea is that opponent is kind of stuck already because he has no open files for the rooks. And you have all the time in the world to maneuver this. Like the biggest mistake you can be making is that... Okay, you just look for the immediate win. No, you just have, you need to have a little bit of patience. And a really important trick that you want to watch out for, okay, if opponent plays like rook f8, setting up the spin, what is the threat? Well, 
he wants bishop takes. So you just want to avoid that, maybe move king g2. Avoid any nonsense like that and uh, should be having an easy conversion from now on. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody getting another white game. going to open up with d4. And you already know what it is. We're going to be sticking with our little aggressive opening. So getting the starting position for the Jubava London. Okay. Knight to c6. Now, do you remember why is knight c6 not the greatest move of all time? Perhaps I may even go this far to say that this is the most common mistake that you are going to be facing uh, below 1000. Well, the problem with this is that you pretty much uh, can catch your opponent in like a triangle choke. If you're like familiar with fighting or anything like that. Knight to b5. It's pretty much, you know just trapping the opponent in a very unpleasant position okay he pretty much has no way to defend the c7 square now the only move that would kind of you know make the game somewhat interesting is e5 and i'm actually super glad that he plays it i recommend you take back with a pawn i find this to be the most practical answer thinking with the bishop is reasonable as well but i just like this way more and okay he plays knight to e4 all right, this is the position where you have no idea how many people go wrong because they think, uh, you know, they can play a move like e6. Black goes bishop to c5. And then they go knight takes one c7 thinking, oh, I'm getting the fork, I'm winning the game. I'm like so clever. No, dude, black just has queen takes on c7 in that position. You think, okay, I'm just going to take with the bishop, collect my free queen. And then he goes bishop takes on f2, checkmate. So don't do that, but instead, play the stunning move. Okay, get yourself uh, ready, put your big boy pants on, because you're going to be going queen takes on d5. All right, queen takes on d5, why is that such a clever move? Well, we want to be taking the knight. And also, what's the point if he takes our free queen? Well, you can just win it back by also collecting another pawn. You go knight to c7. Winning back the queen instantly. Okay, you get the position where you have uh, three extra pawns and uh, he lost the right to castle. So white is having, you know, pretty promising advantage. However, still, you have no idea how many people still mess it up from this position. So you really want to pay attention to the following rules to avoid black's current play. So generally he does bishop e6 or bishop c5 in this position. This is what I would be expecting. So bishop e6. And okay, this is the critical thing that will really dramatically affect your win rate from these positions. So the main mistake that I see people do is that they just go along castle. They think, okay, I defend my knight, and then I also want discovery after I long castle. But the biggest issue with the long castle is that once you do it, there's going to be knight takes on f2, allowing a lot of unnecessary counterplay. So how do you avoid that? Well, you pretty much want to get the same effect of the rook, covering the knight and threatening the discovery, but you still keep your king. Okay, big butt here. Your king is still defending the f2 pawn. So with that, and I promise it's going to be a cure for losing these positions or like not converting them. And then, okay, you have simple plan. You just want to get rid of this knight. Get rid of the only active piece that the opponent has and if you want to go like extra safe you can play c3 as well not allowing knight before and then you just finish development and you have three extra pawns i'm pretty sure you can continue from <laughs> that point he takes just gonna go simple move take back and okay no need at this point to feel like uh, oh i gotta you know his king is on c7 i gotta go e6 you know like uh Usually the biggest uh, mistake that beginners do while they have uh, positions like this, uh, you know, they're just going too crazy in a way that uh, they feel they need to checkmate, otherwise they may die or something. So, no, you have three extra pawns, have a clear target in mind. You just want to avoid counterplay play by your opponent and trade all the pieces, okay? No need to put pressure on yourself and try to do more than that. How do we avoid counterplay? play? Well, this could be annoying. Because this could be annoying, 
the only thread that black has, you play c3. No more of that. Then what do we do? I told you we're gonna get rid of the knight. Very simple stuff, okay? Like at this point, even if you lose like the pawn on e5, you're gonna be still having two extra pawns, which guess what? It is more than enough. So we're gonna be playing f3. Pretty much no matter what he does, and Rook D8 were happy to trade Rooks. Once again, you can perhaps benefit a little bit from playing E6 and then taking on F7. But I feel like the risk reward is just not good enough there. So uh, yeah, he played King B6 move, kind of sidestepping the Diag. But uh, we don't really care, do we? And uh, okay, Knight to C5. We can try to go like super aggressive in the position by playing a move like B4. But guess what can be even better? Yes, this is the position. We're not putting PP pee -pee on the PP pee -pee just yet. But we're going to start with a pin. So what do I mean by that is you want to pin the knight first. And once the knight is pinned, then we're going to be putting pressure on the pin piece. Before his huge threat. How is he defending against that? He's not. <laughs> King to b5. All right. Okay. All right. I guess b4. <laughs> that works. But I think even simpler. You take and then you do b4. Okay. Boom. With another piece and... We just clean him up without, without even like moving these pieces. Do you understand how insane that is? How is white like so crushing where when we're like genuinely playing without three heavy pieces? That is mind blowing. Oh, dude, I'm like so out of this. Ugh. Rook takes on c5. And do you understand that we managed to win a game without the queens being on the board, without having three major pieces? That is just disgusting. That is, folks, the power of the Jubava London. All right. Now, obviously, play by my opponent could have been improved at times. But just to kind of give you an indicator of how the game could have potentially developed. In case of a move like, let's say, bishop to c5, targeting f2. I think a very simple way to deal with this is uh, you play e3. He does whatever, rook d8, you like trade rooks, you play f3. And notice that the knight no longer has any moves. That is just a very simple way to deal with it. I guess he has like a knight e2 type of move, so perhaps you can like start with something even better like knight f3, just not allowing that, but... Yeah, anyways, you do this. Avoid the biggest mistake, which would have been... Uh, the mid bishop e6 with uh, long castle. Like I see that mistake all the time because knight f2 just makes the game unnecessarily tricky. You may still win, but you don't want to mess around from such positions. So yeah, remember knight e6, you catch him in the triangle choke, knight b5, boom. Just you can maybe imagine this is like a triangle if it helps you <laughs> kind of like remember it in a way. And then, punchline of the variation, he plays knight e4. You go queen d5. So, remember that. You got a fork in coming. And besides this, what actually happens even more often, after the opponent plays e5, which is knight h5, okay, here it's a really important move that you really want to remember. Which, yeah, I know it may feel like a little bit unexpected. But is this actually very strong? Because low-rated players really are uncomfortable making a move like e3. And allowing black to take double up the pawns. But no, you're actually like speeding up your development. You're setting up a threat of queen takes on h5. Still, if he's not careful, he may get hit by queen e5. The only important thing to avoid in this position is... Do not get overexcited by playing a move such as queen takes on d5. Because I see this a lot. People just think, oh, I'm brilliant. I'm Albert Einstein reborn. I just saw a tactic in a random video on the internet. I'm going to play it. Yes, but you got to play with a good timing. 
So the idea is you play queen d5, he's not first to take. Like, if he takes, hell, you're brilliant. You're gonna take, defend the bishop. It's all nice and fun. However, you may get to deal with a cold shower, knight f4. He does not have to take, you're just down a piece. So important, pause for a second, and when they go knight h5 instead, just play e3. He takes take back, you have simple plan to develop, extra pawn. And in case of a6, important, keep the knight as active as you can. Just knight e4. Because I see a lot of people just going knight to c3. Which is, you know, not that terrible, but bishop to b4 may get you in trouble. Okay, because of pin, and maybe if he gets to play d4, that can get ugly. Just do knight to d4 instead, and then you do the same. Like knight f3, bishop d3, get castle, you got extra pawn. Get out of here. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody getting another white game. Gonna open up with d4. And, okay, he goes d5. Gonna be developing the knight to c3. So, important move order. You do the knight first. And then we get the bishop out. All right, so this is the kind of main crossroads for black. And we already see that he... He made a decision playing a6, which is actually a move that I am very happy to face because I feel like, uh, you know, once you, let's say, uh, escape the elo hell when you just get started, you are like around maybe like four or five hundred where it is just enough to kind of go for this uh, knight to b5 kind of thingy and just win quickly. Then it is important that you get a good understanding on, uh, okay. What if he plays uh, a6? Are we done? <laughs> are we like... <laughs> right. How are we supposed to handle this? So as a rule of thumb, you want to avoid rushing with a move like knight f3, okay? I want you to like really pay attention to this moment because here most of the people just go wrong without even realizing it. Okay, because they think, okay, we're just... Um, Play opening, we need to like sort of develop pieces. How can that be a bad move? Well, I want you to really understand the fact that whenever they play a move like bishop to f5, you want to be playing the move f3. So how on earth are you going to be playing the move f3 if you already have the knight in the way? So see, that's like the point. Little details like this really make the difference from, okay, an average Jabava on the player or a great one, all right? Just small things. You think it's like, uh, okay, it has to be some kind of uh, really complex tactics that uh, it's impossible for me to reach. No, just little details like this. You have no idea how many people just literally don't understand these things and you can exploit them. See bishop on to f5. Now, the bishop is going out on a sunny day, but we got some bad news. It's going to be raining with pawns. And, you know, sadly, I think the bishop forgot his umbrella at home. We're just going to be throwing these pawns, and this is actually a really important idea that you want to remember. Roll of thumb, you see bishop on f5 in the jabava. You play pawn to f3. I don't care whatever else you need to do. That just triggers pawn move to f3. Okay, he goes there, now h4, threatening to win the bishop. Yeah, he has a choice between h6 or uh, h5. I'd say below 1000, they normally do this. If they go for the more aggressive move, you need to like be really sort of mindful and uh, see, okay, he wants this, so I got to advance. But the good news is that then you can genuinely play the same way uh, as we do. So important on how you develop. Okay. Bishop goes to d3. I like to start with that. I don't think you need to throw in h5. It's like playable, but I like to have the option of pushing and later on be able to take uh, with a pawn. When this guy is defended, okay? You don't want to be forgetting about the rook. That's a rookie mistake. I don't want to get, uh, you know, plunder both of your rooks in the opening. I think that would be pretty good if we manage to avoid it, okay? Gonna be taking with a queen, All right? I want you to always... Take with a queen in these structures. So you see f3, g4. Take with a queen. Simple. Preparing long castle. 
Bishop to d6. Threatening to take and create double pawns. Are we gonna reply to this? We wanna be taking back on f4 with a knight, alright? You wanna be really having this idea in mind and uh, then it's all easy, alright? You play knight e2 like a good boy. Unforced error, by the way, he was not uh, supposed to take because he's just improving my knight, so very common for this rating range. And all right, expecting either knight c6, knight d7, okay, queen d6. Okay, do not play g5. Remember, this is typical blunder, blundering both rooks, and then you're like, uh, oh, Alex Bonds is such a silly guy, he told me this, you buffalo, and I lose every single game. No. Get castled. Have these bad boys defending each other. And then we're going to be playing g5. All right, look. Now he's going to take 100%. It's like not even a question about it. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's a move. But that just gives a free knight. Which you can take by all means. But in order to make this a little bit more instructive, I want to show you another idea. So let's imagine you have this pawn structure and he had moved the knight. You want to play, play g6? Okay. You can take your free knight, sure. That's fine. But how about this idea? I bet you haven't even considered it. And just look how deadly it becomes. You take there and now you hit him with boom. He tries to go after the pawn. He's immediately getting sunburned by the knight. I know that does not make a whole lot of sense, but you get it. I'll be reinforcing the knight. Uh, whenever something like this happens, it's not a problem because you can get rid of the knight. I actually get that question a lot on how are we supposed to deal with knight to b4 type of move. Well, you just don't lose the queen. Okay, make sure. If, if it's advice that I can give, try not hanging your queen. And then the rest is pretty simple. You take off the knight, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to break the rules. I'm not taking towards the center. Just to kind of uh, force these trades. And then, uh, yeah, you get like a pretty easy, removable even uh, checkmate. I'm going to just speed up a little because I only have uh, 10 seconds. But I'm sure you guys can keep up with the, what a pace, I mean. I, uh... I know my viewers are on the more advanced spectrum, right? <laughs> it's going to be taking. Then rook g6, then queen b6, likely. If king a4, there's queen b3, mate. Yeah, so this becomes a thing. You can even pre-move it, and okay, this is going to be mate next. All right. Lots of things happening. So first off... When we play bishop to d3, very important, he is borderline forced to exchange. But it is actually very important to know uh, what to do in case they don't. Because a lot of, you know, people in this rating range make such a horrific mistake. They just ignore your move, they're gonna be playing, you know, just night out, or they're gonna do whatever. How do you punish these guys? Well, the point is you pretty much play exactly like you saw in the game, like we would normally do. So you go bishop takes on g6. And then you go queen d3. So pretty much same placement for the queen as in the game. But there is a huge difference in the position. Just look at this pawn. How is he going to defend that pawn? That is just really going to be painful for him to deal with uh, for the rest of the game. He has to... Most, you know, in most cases, he has to make a move like king f7. Or even knight back. You know, he could also do that. But typically, it goes like this. You go castle, you go like your usual uh, knight e2. You have h5, g5 ideas. King is weak, white is just much better. Never be afraid of knight before. You have easy move back. Go e3, kick the knight. Uh, so, like, let's say this happens. You kick the knight, queen goes back, and uh, nothing happened. So... That is first important thing. And then I want to show you what if uh, he would have taken, right? Like most of your opponents will. Stick with the pawn. Now he's going to throw an intermediate move. We take back. 
And here, from my experience, people tend to go back to G8. Casey would have gone like knight to d7. I am pretty sure it would have been very nice to throw in this check. He has only one move, otherwise he's losing the rook. So he needs to block with a knight. And then you have a very nice move to infiltrate. You just have to go queen to h7, penetrating the king side. Okay, what is he going to play not to lose the pawn? He's going to do g6. And okay, now you think. You're pretty much in there. Very cozy. We can do a lot of things. I would say usually we have a move like queen g8 or queen g7. And then we maneuver. Okay, I like queen g8 specifically because first of all, he cannot castle as that allows queen f7. And he's pretty much stuck. In a lot of positions, let's just imagine he does some kind of nonsense. You have rook h7. Why is rook h7 so clever? You may be thinking, oh, who's just going to be defending with uh, queen e7? Yes, but that is because you're overlooking a very important tactical idea. You have knight takes on g6. He's literally pinned all over the place. Oh man, he's like completely tied. You see this? Boom. And he just went with the Jabava London. So... Now, in the other case, say he would have gone like knight to g8. This is pretty much similar. You go rook a j9. Now, this time, they're going to be thinking, uh, oh, I'm so clever. I'm going to go castle. But then you hit them with queen h7. And that's pretty much usually just winning the pawn. Most of the times, they're going to play like knight e7. You take the pawn. And white is doing pretty well. So, yeah. That's, you know, when they take, very common. In the game, I have to say, I kind of think he may have mouse slipped, to be honest. Therefore, that's why I did not uh, grab the knight, which you should in your games. But I, I just wanted to show you this idea of already like playing g6. And imagine he takes your queen gets to immediately infiltrate and deal a lot of damage to black's position. Now, assuming he defends pawn on g7. We can combine this with uh, rook to g1, reinforcing the threat, and then... How do you win on queen e7? I think that is a very good question. And it's a very good test to see your uh, basic uh, fundamental tactical ideas. Alright, spoiler alert, you have two good moves. Simplest, 96, boom. Why is that so clever? Pretty much, we're trying to deflect the main defender of the g7 square. So you can also notice that the queen is overloaded, defending very two very big weaknesses in black's camp. So by taking on e6, we're saying, okay, you cannot take with the queen, because then we take g7. Once we take g7, we're not only taking that, but also we're taking our opponent's dignity. Plus the aj rook. No, I'm kidding. You actually take both rooks. Why not? Two rooks is better than one. So, knight e6 is nice. However, I'm also going to give you a bonus point for queen g7. You take, it's a queen sack, it's tempting, then you win back the queen with a few extra pawns. That's also fine. But just 96 was better. So, yeah, g6, just a really crazy important move that you want to have it in your arsenal. It will normally happen uh, in positions where after h4, he plays something like h5, okay? Like, this is usually the way it happens. And you're going to get this uh, more frequently above, like, 1,000. But even if you're, like, below that, I wouldn't neglect it. Because I still see it all the time in, uh, you know, games of uh, people that I've coached. So, h5, you do g5, hit the knight, trade. Pretty much simple stuff. Knight to castle. And then, remember, key idea to break through g 6 In case he plays it himself. Uh, well... Don't worry, you can still play for something like e4. And the key idea that a lot of people are missing in this structure is that, okay, you're going to be playing e4. Then h5 is the biggest weakness. So, if you maneuver your pieces properly, okay, let's just assume black does some kind of, like, whatever moves. Okay, let's say, I would say a3 could be included here, not to allow knight b4, but let's say we play knight f4. 
And just to kind of uh, prove a point, let's say knight c7, you go knight e2. Because this is the biggest weakness in white's camp. This is usually the kind of position where uh, a lot of people tend to get stuck with the Jumbavalon and then maybe they even decide to dump the opening for no reason. But oh, we actually have one stunning idea that is going to be completely game changer. And the weaker Chess.com engines are not even going to see this coming. Like, let's say black plays v5, you know, just pushing, doing whatever. Well, what if I tell you you can already sacrifice the knight? Knight takes on h5. Just literally giving up a knight for a pawn. He takes. But okay, you have knight f4 or knight g3, both are the same. Idea being, you're going to be taking that pawn on h5. Okay, you have simple moves, like maybe even e5, knight f6, rook g1, push these pawns. You've got like two pawns for the piece. But just this kind of uh, positional pressure having these pawns against his king is devastating. Alright, this idea is incredibly scary, incredibly powerful. I already got to use this a bunch of times onto my main account. So when I'm playing games around 26, uh, 2700 in Blitz, this is still allowed. They just get no card play. So, I would say, in a nutshell, these are the main ideas uh, about uh, Bishop to f5. And you really want to remember this, okay? You want to start with uh, e3 before you play knight f3. Because, you know, a lot of people make the mistake of trying to, like, really focus on the more, like, in-depth strategy that I've just explained. Trying to grasp those ideas. But then when they have to play an actual game, they're like, oh, I'm playing Jabov, I'm going to do knight f3. They just autopilot, they're not thinking. You're not thinking he plays bishop to f5, you no longer have f3, it's no good. How are you going to apply these things? You're not. So, that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting the white pieces, going to open up with d4 and uh, seeking for a good old Jabov. And then we see knight f6, just going to start the precise way, getting the knight out... Uh, Threatening to push e4, which I guess opponent is pretty comfortable with because he can transpose back into the French. Now, in this position, you have a lot of options. I'm going to stick with bishop to f4 because this is the cleanest path of getting uh, Jubavalon. And we could just be transposing into a lot of well-known variations. However, if you're a more advanced player and you're somehow afraid of these kind of tricky bishop to b4 variations, there is also a pretty interesting uh, exploit to just play the move a3 and then stick with the bishop f4 move. But I'm just going to do the clean one. If he plays bishop to b4, fine. I'm going to show you how to play that position. But chances are a lot of your opponents are going to do exactly what my opponent did and that is d5. And pretty much with d5 he is just transposing into a very common main line, okay? Where white pretty much has a choice between two moves. You can either do e3. Or you can play knight b5, my favorite move. Okay, knight b5, immediately targeting the c7 square and pretty much forcing black to do a concession. At this point, they have a choice between uh, three main moves. Generally, it's going to be a 50-50 between bishop d6 and knight a6 if you are playing these, uh, let's say, below 2000. If you're above that, however, they can also go, go for bishop to b4 check. Point being that uh, after c3, uh, black has, you know, idea to go bishop to a5, defend it this way. Which is definitely a very sort of sound variation, but incredibly rare. Below 2000 at least. So opponent plays bishop to d6. Now this is already the first important uh, critical moment, because typically players just kind of randomly take on d6. However, the answer is pretty simple and pretty straightforward, as long as you have a basic understanding of why the pieces should be valued in chess. Okay, if you are just, let's say, very new to the game, uh, you probably learned that both knight and bishop are equal three points. However, if you know me, I like to say that uh, the bishop is worth like three points and a quarter. Therefore, it's going to be a positive trade for us to take with a knight, winning the bishop pair, all right? Try to get into the habit of generally considering first knight capture bishops not the other way okay it's big difference now i like to play e3 
As a rule of thumb in the Jobava, we like to play E3 before uh, we develop the Knight to F3. And uh, yeah, this is a pretty thematic pawn structure that you want to have in mind when they get these pawns lined up like this. However, opponent plays a pretty common mistake, okay? Why is bishop to d7 a mistake? Well, it is pretty much just leaving the d6 pawn undefended. So that is pretty much just free to take. However, because I feel like, uh, you know, we could bring uh, more value to the table if we just ignore the blunder. I'm going to go knight f3. He checks me. When the check happens, I'm just going to play c3. Otherwise, I would have developed the bishop to e2. And still, is he going to notice that pawn on d6 is hanging? That is like pretty funny. Oh, okay. He apparently does play queen b6. And he's not only defending, but also attacking the pawn on b2. So, okay, you have uh, a choice. At this point, usually when you can play rook b1, that is a pretty okay move. Just simply defending. However, when possible, queen b3 is even nicer. Because we were creating a threat of taking and then the pawn is once again hanging. So he takes only move to recapture, but in the meantime, we have managed to open up the rook. Still, the pawn is like <laughs> forever hanging on d6. Once again, I'm just going to act like that's not there, okay? Just to show you a more instructive middle game idea. About the light square bishop, it's important that you understand whenever there is a pawn structure like this, because opponent perhaps in the future could play e5, e4. You don't want to have the bishop on d3 because that would be forking these two pieces. So I'm playing bishop to e2 instead. Idea is to castle short. And I'm going to be genuinely playing for queenside pressure here. Okay, because we got double pawns. Typical idea is to do b4, b5. Try to get rid of the knight. And once the knight is going to be leaving the area, then the a7 pawn is going to be pretty vulnerable. Plus, we have the two bishop, just uh, like a pretty nice long-term asset. Okay, you can compare it with, uh, you know, something like uh, Ethereum. Oh, never mind. I meant to say, we can compare that maybe with Bitcoin. So, you know, it's like pretty safe, pretty stable to have. And um, yeah, then maybe you can even skyrocket in the future. If it does not, it's fine. You get to like get your money back, I guess, hopefully. Unless you are part of a really nasty Ponzi scheme. But anyways, you get a point. Knight to h5, just targeting the bishop. Typically, we'll try to keep the bishop, okay? I'm not going to be giving uh, my opponent a free bishop just like that. And when g5 happens, you can stick with simple move bishop g3. But I'm also going to be showing you the other cheeky idea. Just move the knight and uh, either keep the bishop or make this trade while opponent's pawn structure has been um, kind of destroyed in the process. Okay, and if rook g8, I'm just going to play uh, king h1 type of move just to avoid h3 because then we simply take. I even have idea to play g3 and maybe try to take it with a bishop. So take it uh, in a clean way at some point. Of course, not like immediately doing that because I'm going to lose my bishop. But in the future... That could be a thing, okay? I like to really think a lot about uh, long-term plans and uh, more, you know, like rarely in terms of what do we do move by move. You know, it is pretty hard to think uh, that way about chess, especially as you are getting uh, started, but I think it is something that uh, you can try to practice, uh, especially more... Uh, when you have uh, traded queens, okay? When you're playing an endgame, it is generally easier to kind of have more of like a long-term idea of what you are planning to do. Since most of the end games, really, it's less about concrete calculation, but more about uh, how you place your pieces, especially for low-rated games, okay? If you're talking about like a high-level chess, like, you know, top-level, a player like uh, Vladimir Kramnik uh, used to say that, uh, you know, endgame is a lot about calculation because less pieces on the board, easier to calculate. However, uh, yeah, for low-rated players, 
not the case. It's mainly about how you position your pieces, finding the like weak squares, weak, uh, you know, weak pawns, weak pieces, pretty much uh, any target that uh, you can come up with gonna be enough for the end game, okay? End game, therefore, it's pretty easy and uh, manageable for low rated games. I'll have to speed up a little bit as my opponent seems to be trying his hardest to flag me. Which is definitely not something that I like to see, but uh, okay, if opponent really wants to, I'm gonna give him a, a fight at least. I'm gonna try to play pretty quickly. You guys know that I'm not very famous for my, uh, you know, <laughs> ability to play fast moves, but at least I uh, I can see uh, winning king and pawn end games once upon a time. I'm just gonna try to play for Zugzwang. He's gonna go king back. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep pushing. Notice that I uh, constantly have to pre move BA in case he's going for anything uh, dirty. He's just gonna get a queen. Four seconds left. Wait, he's not taking the second pawn. That is rather a uh, odd decision, odd um, yeah idea by him. <laughs> this is definitely gonna make it uh, easier for me to mate. Still, I'm gonna I'm not gonna remove it uh, all the way because it may lead to perpetual. Oh, never mind. He didn't try to come close and uh, we managed to get a checkmate with pre moves so yeah the end was definitely pretty close however uh, you know considering the fact that my opponent has literally blundered a very critical pawn on like move I believe it was nine <laughs> <laughs> when did he play bishop d7? It was like move six actually, so even uh, even earlier. We gave him like a pretty easy time, okay? Like he definitely uh, made a pretty long resistance. And he, wait, he waited for like one second and then he resigned? Such a weirdo. <laughs> I mean, if you plan to resign, why wait like the whole 19 seconds? Just leave your clock run out. Anyways, that's like beyond my understanding. So, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, definitely here first mistake, take free pawn. And besides that, uh, what can I say? The end game is <laughs> once again, pretty nice uh, to play. He tried to go after the bishop. Keep in mind this juicy idea, plain ID too. And I mean, he should definitely try something like this. Still cashing in the bishop, but uh, at least, you know, it is a pretty nice idea that uh, you want to keep in mind because then, okay, he just has to play with a worse pawn structure for the rest of the game. All right, and I think pretty interesting moment here. I kind of knew like GH would be a uh, top uh, preferred move by the computer. However, G3 is interesting uh, motive because if we manage to like get the full pawn on H3, that is just instantly winning. If you take on H3, he's definitely going to have some compensation, okay? It's like, it is not very easy to win this type of games while having, you know, the only asset being the H3 pawn. Okay, it's sure, it's an extra pawn, but it's a double pawn. Very tricky to make pass pawn. So, uh, yeah, we played G3, played it more for like uh, long-term uh, domination, got a knight to H4. I kind of knew like his pawn is not running anywhere. So if he tries like something passive, rook H8, let's say. Uh, I think b4, b5 was mainly on my radar to get rid of the knight and open up another path for the attack. And uh, okay, with a passive bishop, definitely big weakness on h3. I felt very comfortable in this endgame. So with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. I really appreciate you making it this far into the video. And before I let you go, I just wanted to say that this is not, you know, just a nice little cheesy opening that you can use. But this is actually very serious. So serious that I even went this far to hire Jobava himself so that uh, we can work together on a beautiful course about the Jobava London. 
So stay tuned for that. Big things coming in the future. I appreciate the support. And until then, I'll see you during the next video. Take care.